Bitcoin butchery, cryptocurrencies struggle to regain ground after losses not seen in years. What prompted the sell-off? And is the crisis a game-changer? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. Well, the crypto gold rush is going through another dip, but this time it's gone so low, some are warning it may not stop. Many digital currencies have seen their values reach zero. That's knocked a lot of confidence out of the market, creating a domino effect reaching all the way to the top. The mother of them all, Bitcoin, is in trouble. Two major trading platforms have dropped it. One cited technical problems and the other the so-called crypto winter, meaning the current extreme market conditions. Well, as investors become increasingly nervous, more have been selling off their coins. Pretty scary times in the Bitcoin space, but actually not something we haven't seen before. Uh, this is an asset that went down 94% back in 2011 and came back from the dead. It went down 84, 85% uh, after the peak in 2013 to the trough of late 2014, early 2015. And then again, went down, I believe about 85% from 19,700 to around 3150, if I recall, in December of 2018. You have to be 70% lucky and 30% knowledgeable to win in this market. If you are in the right place at the right time, there is no way you can't win. And it's not like 5 times, 10 times or 2 times profit. It's almost 100 times, 500 times, 1000 times. There is no state, no institution, no organization that gives you this kind of profit. You just have to be lucky actually. Well, the more people sell Bitcoin, the less it's worth. And people have been selling big time. In November, the crypto coin reached a record high value of nearly 70,000 US dollars. But in the following months, it started going down, reaching 35,000 in January. It took another blow in early May, falling below 30,000. And by June, it had lost another $10,000, dropping below its benchmark value of 20,000. Well, let's bring our guests into the show. We have joining us from Nairobi, Ali Khan Sachu, an investor and CEO at Rich Management. In London, Naeem Aslam is Chief Market Analyst at Avatrade. And in Dublin, Brian Lucy, Professor of International Finance and Commodities at Trinity Business School. Welcome to you all. Let me start with Professor Brian then. What prompted the sell-off in the first place, Brian? Well... <laughs> Bitcoin and other cryptos, and, and we tend to use them, you know, indistinguishably. As you said, it's the, you know, the granddaddy of them all, and and where it leads, in, you know, in the rest follow. Has been suffering from some weakness since really the end of last year, if not before. What's really knocked Bitcoin, I think, and and the rest of them has been the fact that, as the global economic environment, economic and geopolitical environment, has become more and more uncertain. We've got supply chain issues, not just from the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, but also from Chinese policies around COVID. We have uh, a problem with regards to the likelihood of quantitative tightening, in other words, unwinding the, the wall of money that was poured into the global economy uh, with the consequent inflation issues coming from both that and from the, uh, the, the war. All of these have made the global risk environment much more risky. And what we've seen is that the real reason why many of these cryptos, crypto assets, they're not really cryptocurrencies, showed such an increase was a desire for yield. At the very top of your show there, you were talking to people saying, well, you can get 100% return, 100 times return. But you only get those kind of massive returns in exchange for massive risk. And what we've seen is that as the appetite for risk has decreased as things have got more uncertain people investors have been moving in general back towards more safe havens but hang on brian let me jump in here and, and ask i thought the whole sure. mantra we were told about cryptocurrencies is that 
people put their money into them to actually protect themselves from inflation and uncertainty. Yes, we were, we, we, right? we, 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 that was, if you look at well, the, the, the countries with the top investments in Bitcoin, were countries yes. which had very big inflationary problems. How did inflation go from being a driver towards to a detractor from uh, cryptocurrencies? Because they aren't. I mean, this is, of course, what you would be told if you're trying to sell an asset that's hyper risky. Mm. You'll find a use for it, find a use case. We've won precise. We've, we, these, these are not currencies. We, we, we must put, put this phraseology to bed. These are crypto assets. We've precisely won in situation in El Salvador where we've had a natural experiment of running a fiat currency, in fact, not even its own currency, the dollar, versus a crypto. And every single asset, uh, every, every single uh, study that has been done has shown that there has been incredibly limited usage of this as a currency. As an asset, they're very risky. They have some interesting characteristics. They're very, very volatile. That's the nature of the beast. That volatility, if you're on the right place at the right time, can give you a great return. But they are not for everybody. They right. are a hard currency structure in that many of them have a limited number of tokens or satoshis or you know whatever you can create that can only ever be created. And as a result, there is an inbuilt bias towards appreciation of the nominal value. But that's not the same to say that they are a hedge against inflation. Right. But it's interesting. I mean, some countries, I, th I think Turkey was one of them, uh, Russia was another. That was the reason why we were told people were putting their money, because they were afraid about their local currencies losing value. Let's bring in Naeem. We was also the collapse of some of the other coins like Terra USD. Did it contribute to what we've seen happening in the wider digital coin market? I completely concur with you. When you are in a new cycle of innovation technologies, blowout like these, they do happen as a market adjusts a new reality, a new product. Mm. And as you guys were discussing earlier, you know, search for a good, better yield product obviously created an enormous amount of greed in this space. Like you could get yield, which was completely unheard of, up to 30 or 25%. So that created a massive bulb, a, a, a bubble uh, around everything. So basically, just like how our traditional systems, uh, financial systems work, where one bank is pretty much using the money from another bank, and then you have that domino effect already taking place in the crypto world, because a lot of these yield players they, they they come from traditional markets now. They are not your you know your ICO people who had no idea, although they do still exist in the market. But they're using the same sort of mentality. So once that pool begins to flow between the institution, of course, there's a massive risk of domino effect. One institution falling, or one startup, or one particular project falls, and then you have other projects coming on the back of that as well. So we've seen that in the case of Celsius, even now Blockify, which was another yield-based project being rescued by FTX, another American exchange. So the story kind of really goes on. Now, going back to some of the points that you guys were discussing earlier, and I just wanted to add two important things to them. Look, I'm not saying that Bitcoin is still not a hedge um, against uncertainty. I'm not saying that Bitcoin is not a hedge against inflation. But what I do think that it is plausible to ask this particular question is the, re the reputation has massively been impacted. Because as Brian mentioned earlier, you know, we are living has it been in damaged too much name. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, inflation is at 40 decade over 40 years high, right? Four decade high. We should we should see Bitcoin prices completely, you know, uh, like literally soaring on the back of that. We've seen the evidence of gold prices at least showing stability when dollar index is already at its multi-year high. So we, we see that, but usually when the Federal Reserve tightens the monetary policy, we see you know, do, uh, gold prices moving to the downside, but gold prices are very much stable because of inflation. And in terms of a Bitcoin 
we should we should have seen a lot more buying really happening. Now, the same argument goes for the uncertainty in the market as well, with the risk of climate, with the markets falling. You know, now the correlation between Bitcoin, which is the relationship whether moving positive or negative, between Bitcoin and the stock market is very much positive. What does that entail? That means that Bitcoin is very much acting as a riskier asset or as a risk on asset, if I, if I, if I, if I say that. that uh, and this is more appropriate statement, not as a risk of asset, because we don't see Bitcoin moving to the upside when stock markets are moving in the other direction. Right. So. Ali, I guess what we're Hello? saying so far here is that there was Bitcoin or digital currencies, cryptocurrencies, were simply a mechanism for wild gains, a lot of risk. And when it wasn't delivering that kind of gain anymore, the bubble was too big and it just had to burst at some point. I couldn't agree more. It reminds me of that quote by Hunter S. Thompson, life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather skidding broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. We've had the ride. The ride is over now. Um, uh, essentially, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies were, more, uh, were not the antidote to central bank bu bubbles. They were a symptom of it. And in the last two, three years, the era of free money, the era of, you know, the trampoline, the idea that you could generate those returns that were described at the beginning of your show, the fear of missing out, FOMO, you know, all, all, um, all were conducive for this extraordinary bubble that we saw develop. And unfortunately, the bubble is now deflated I think we've still got considerable downside. It is no longer investable by any institution. We had that, that, that period when the likes of Elon were piling into it and then promoting all kinds of other coins like Dogecoin. But in any institution now reporting Bitcoin or even a cryptocurrency on its balance sheet is going to find its CFO shown the door you know, in the blink of an eye. So I think what we're seeing now is really uh, the end of an era. It was exciting. Um, uh, uh, some people made a ton of money. More people have lost it. But essentially, this this gig is over. All right, and those are just big words, Ali. The gig is over. Yeah. I can see Naeem is shaking his head in disagreement. So I want to give him a, a chance to come in here with a, a different perspective on this. Is the party over, Naeem? Are you packing up? And I never, and I really put my money where my mouth is because I'm literally, uh, for disclaimer purposes, I'm a big holder uh, and I hold Bitcoin in my wallet and I'm continue to, uh, and I'll continue to do that even at a lower price. It, even though, the, of, even though what, what Ali and what Brian was saying, you know, a lot of this was just driven by pure speculation, pure greed, and the era of easy money, people borrowing money to buy digital currencies that they perhaps couldn't really afford that's over now it was so much they weren't so much buying money if i could jump out, borrowing All money right, go ahead it yeah. was that with, with with money slushing around the system uh you're going to have a situation where it's going to fly into all sorts of areas where you can get a return particularly mm. when you got relatively low inflation as we've had over the last five seven years and it's not just bitcoin it's not just nfts there's been a whole host of other assets where there have been Got rapid it. price appreciation. But it is so one, of the, one of the assets that are deflating because there's not enough money throwing around now. Well, around. it's not so much that. I think it's because it's, it's, it's you know, the, the first one that really deflated was the NFT because the idea that, you know, a picture of a, a monkey in a hat would have inherent value other than being a picture of a monkey in a hat was always completely bonkers. These crypto assets have some, I, I, I kind of disagree with, Madame Lagarde, I, I think what these are, are valueless, but not worthless. They have a worth to people who believe in the need for a parallel decentralized monetary exchange system and who are happy to accept the incredibly high volatility. 
Now, okay. does that mean they're worth 50, 60, 70,000 euro? Or is it 50, 60,000, 50, 60 euro? There's probably a floor which is above zero. Mm. But it's, I think, probably an awful lot, long, an awful long way away from fifteen or seventeen thousand dollars. So, I, I think the era has gone out in the sense of, you know, the wild days. That was always going to happen. Once these were never going to be a currency, and they never were going to be a currency, then they were only ever going to be an asset. If you're going to have an asset, then that asset is ultimately, if it becomes big enough, be regulated. We've seen increasing regulation. Okay, hang on, Brian. Before we we'll get into and, and, regulation, and we'll, we'll get into regulation in a minute. But, but since... yeah, I know. Let me just finish my point. You were seeing increasing regulation and discussion of regulation, and the increasing maturity of these markets with things like ETFs and options and futures. All Once right. that happened, as said, they became inextricably linked to the remainder of, of the financial system, which they hadn't been before, and therefore became, as was said, a risk-on asset. All right, uh, Naeem, you are presenting the opposite perspective and I interrupted you, so let me give you the chance to complete the thought about why the party is still on for you. Sure, thank you. So, like, if you are talking about, you know, excessive money, printing money, QE, whatever you want to call it, deflated the entire space, look at, look at NASDAQ, look at S&P 500, look at Dow Jones, everything is pretty much crushing, but not to an extent. But if you look at the individual stocks, the meme stocks and everything else, they were obviously, and clearly they were very much pumped because of excessive money from the retail side of the institution. Bitcoin is a different beast, as I've mentioned to you previously. It has a history of coming back very rapidly back to its all-time highs. And I think my only concern in relation to this particular one is that I wanted to see that credibility coming back a little bit, meaning Bitcoin needs to re-establish itself as a, re as, as a hedge against uncertainty, as a hedge against inflation. Those are the two primary concerns in relation to that. But having said that, I think uh, given where the price is currently, and then yes, there are odds that perhaps we may see a move further to the downside, perhaps 13 to 15,000. That is where I see the floor or a massive bid. So you bids don't really think, coming. Naeem, that it's going to head to zero? No. As some some no, analysts are saying. <laughs> no. I, 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 look, you know, we had many of those calls. And then the simple answer to that is just listen from one and then let it go from the other side because it's all about filtering through the noise and then looking through that what is the really future for this one? All right, Ali, do you, has, all right, let me ask Ali, do you agree with that? Have we approached the floor here? No, I, look, I, I think, um, you know, we're going to see face ripping, short covering rallies, um, but, you know, because when something falls like this, you're always going to get these very vicious bounces. But I think, you know, what we've seen now is, is a turning point. It was exponential to the upside, it's now exponential to the downside. I mean, if you can you can make an argument that it could go down as low as a thousand, where it was somewhere in 2016. Okay, it might not go to zero, but it's going a lot lower. And I think uh, you know it's a feedback loop. And at at a more macro level, um, as I said earlier, this was a symptom of central bank bubbles. It was not an antidote to them. And now we've, we're exiting the era of central bank bubbles. Um, it's impossible for Western governments to run their economies by just printing uh, endless amounts of money. And this is why we've got inflation lifting off. And what it tells us is the world understands that the hedge against inflation is hard or soft assets like food, uh, like oil, like wheat, things you can't print. Um, and essentially, those are the true hedges. And I think this was a wonderful, delirious episode. And delirium can last for quite a long time. And it did last for, for, a, for a very long time. But ultimately, I go back to that South Sea prospectus, where it was said, you know, there are many schemes. This is a scheme, the carrying on of an undertaking of great advantage, but nobody knows what it is. And frankly, to this day, 
nobody really does. All right. I, they give you I a love lot of the variety language. perspective we're getting here. Very can, different. Can I make a request? Can I make a request? All right, very briefly, then we'll briefly, then we want to go to back, Brian. Very briefly, here. Aslan. Go ahead, Aslan, briefly. Sorry, I'm saying, can I make a request? And that is, let's have three of us back here towards the end of this year. And Ooh. look at the price action. Oh, all right. Ooh. That's that's a good one. All right. <laughs> Somebody's going to be great. right and someone's going to be wrong. Um, Brian, the fact that we're seeing institutional investors dumping their digital coins right now, the, the fact we're seeing crypto exchanges announcing layoffs, is that a sign that things are not going back to where they were? Not any time soon, at least. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're, we're moving into a different environment. How long that will last, you know, another old expression is the market can stay illogical longer than you can stay liquid. Mm. Uh, flip that around. The market can stay logical longer than you can stay illogical in, in, in the context of cryptos. Mm. Until such time as we move through this inflationary era, which is partially driven by a wall of money and partially driven by supply shocks, until we move to an environment where yields are pushed down on traditional things like you know government stocks and commodities such as wheat you know all the boring boring stuff then there will be an appetite again for hyper risky assets and and that's where the remaining crypto assets and there will be some uh, will will come back and have their day in the sun again along with something else but they're not cryptocurrencies let's stop using that phrase they're just assets they're crypto assets they, they are not, never have been, and never will be a substitute for fiat currency. All right. The only substitute for fiat currency we're going to get will be central bank digital currencies. All right. Whatever we're going to call them, Naeem, is this a turning point in terms of at least regulation that going forward, they will now need to be regulated in a very different way? That's an excellent uh, question. Now, the answer to that particular question is look at this crypto landscape today do we have more regulations in comparison to two or three years ago or when was the last crash happened the answer to that one is clearly yes because we have many exchanges which are very much regulated in the united states and in various different jurisdictions and even till this day acquisitions are only happening so that those exchanges can operate under the licenses under the regulations of that particular jurisdiction so I think the current blowout in Terra Luna is going to only, in, or in the, in the high yield space, is only going to invite more regulators to come and provide that security. To Who's the, going to provide uh, that regulation yeah. name? And what will it mean for what was supposed to be a very free-flowing, decentralised, I don't want to use the word currency because I know Brian doesn't like it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Look, like, I, I, I think there are still so many different proposals on the table. Who is really going to provide that? But there is one thing very clear. As human being, you want it to be governed by one single entity, rather whatever jurisdiction you are. And, and, and that goes back, and that's, that's why the fiat currencies are really working, or, or any other currencies, because you have a central bank, you have a government which can really come in, and then they can, they can, they can, uh, initiate some uh, uh, phenomena like you know bank run. They can stop that. They can say that okay, you can no, you cannot withdraw more than three hundred euros or two hundred or fifty euros during the pigs crisis, right? We've seen that. We do not have that currently in the crypto space. But now, yes, we do see some initial reactions and actions by these particular companies such as Celsius and few others, where they're saying okay, you know what, all withdrawals are suspended. But the that's companies not regulation, that's desperation. That's desperation because the whole point of having decentralized peer to peer finance is that it isn't regulated, that the market finds its own regulation. Stopping right. people from transacting on unregulated markets is not regulation, it's people trying to prop up liquidity positions for you know for perfectly sensible and sane reasons. The, okay. the reality is, we know where this goes. It'll be regulated by the SEC. It'll be regulated by the FSA. It'll be regulated by the ECB. It'll form part of some successor to MFID. It'll be just another boring but very risky set of assets. All right, I'm afraid we are out of time. I know that we've got plenty of different perspectives on this, and uh, perhaps, as Naeem said, we'll come back and talk about this right all again when either, you know, the coin has gone up or down. 
But for now, thanks so much, guys. It's been a great discussion. Thank you. So thank our guests, Ali Khan Sachu, Naeem Aslam, and Brian Lucy. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here in Doha. For now, it's goodbye.